My name is Sherilyn Parsons. I'm the founder and director of the Bay Area Book Festival. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much for coming. And uh, this festival, speaking of altruism, really is a labor of love and a gift to the community. And your being here um, is a gift to the festival organizers. So thank you for this. And it's also very heartening to see so many people coming for a session on altruism. Um, really bodes well for the state of the world. So thank you for being here. And I'm going to introduce um, primarily Pico Iyer and then tell you a little bit about the work being done by Matthew Ricard. Um, and then Pico will do a more thorough introduction of Matthew when they both come on stage. Um, Pico is a British-born essayist and novelist, long based in both California and Japan. He's the author of numerous books about crossing cultures, among them the classic Video Night in Kathmandu, my favorite book of his, which is called The Lady and the Monk, The Global Soul, and most recently, A Guide to the Richest Land of All, that of one's own inner wellspring of peace, called The Art of Stillness, Adventures in Going Nowhere. This book, Altruism, The Power of Compassion to Change Yourself in the World, is the one that Matthew will be speaking about. It's on sale in the lobby, um, and um, all proceeds from this book will be donated to the uh, charity that Matthew has started called Karuna Shechen, and Karuna means compassion. The charity is based on the idea of compassion in action. And he founded Karuna Shechen, Shechen um, based on the, ideal, uh, the, the, the idea that in order to address the inequalities and suffering he observed in the Himalayan region, where he's lived in the last, for the last 40 years, um, he really wanted to do something very active um, around the issues of healthcare, education, and social services, um, particularly in, the, in, uh, in Tibet, Nepal, and India. And the uh, programs place special emphasis on empowering women and young girls and the preservation of cultural heritage. Right now, they are uh, doing a lot of work with um, survivors of the earthquakes in Nepal. Um, I think you were saying something like 64,000 people are, have been served um, through the work with earthquakes. So your purchase of this book after the session will go directly um, toward that work. So you will be practicing an act of altruism by buying a book on altruism, which will benefit you, will benefit the world as well. So please join me in welcoming Pico Iyer and Matthew Ricard to the Bay Area Book Festival. Thank you. Thank you. I have to wrap that around. Hello, everybody. Um, since this is the first ever Bay Area Book Festival, somebody suggested it would be wonderful to have a celebrated photographer with us whose work has been praised by Cartier-Bresson, no less. And then somebody else thought, why don't we have a doctor of cellular genetics who got a PhD under a Nobel Prize winner? And then a clever third person said, what we really need at this festival, which we don't have otherwise, is a scientist who's been at the front lines of the research over the last 15 years, actually measuring the effects on compassion and peace of mind of meditation. And then somebody said, well, every book festival needs a wise man <laughs> who studied under the greatest minds of the age. Uh, so the panel today is all those four people and many more <laughs> in the single person of Mathieu Ricard. <laughs> <laughs> and I know the reason you're all here is you remember that Mathieu, maybe 17, 18 years ago, brought out that classic book, The Monk and the Philosopher, with his father, in which his father essentially asked Mathieu why he'd become a monk, and Mathieu asked his father why he hadn't. <laughs> uh, Mathieu later brought out his book on happiness, which is really, to me, a lucid and illuminating book on how all of us, regardless of our religion or lack of religion, have the capacity for more happiness than we know. And as you just heard from Sherilyn, 
This week, in English at last, has appeared his 850-page magnum opus, I think, on altruism, uh, which brings together cutting-edge research from labs across the planet, a really deep command of the philosophies of East and West, and extraordinary data on everything from homicide rates to climate change, to show not only how altruism can make our lives and the lives of people around us far better, but also how it can transform our relation to animals, to the environment, and to the world. So it's a real privilege to see you again, Mathieu. And I suppose the obvious first question is an impolite one, which is, all of us here know that we ought to be altruistic. We've all been taught do unto others as yeah. you would have them do unto you. Why do we need an 858-page book? <laughs> yes, I want that myself, I must say. <laughs> but first about those supposedly four people. <laughs> no, I, I wish there would be one of them will be always sitting in my hermitage in the front of the Himalayas. That would be great if I could split into four <laughs> or five like that. <laughs> yes, well, uh, I think there is uh, no need to write a book uh, to prove that selfishness exists. Although some, as you know, have been recommending selfishness, like uh, the virtue of selfishness of mm -hmm. someone I hardly dare to pronounce the name of. <laughs> but, uh, well, for, anyway. <laughs> you know. <laughs> but, uh, well, I think there was no need, actually, to write this book. Because deep in our deepest of our heart, we know, I think, that we are capable of moments of unconditional love, that there are moments we only think we wish to someone else is may that person be happy, flourish, may that person be spared suffering, may that person you know, fulfill a potential in life. And just as, you know, when I wake up in the morning, normally, unless something really, really heavily terrible in my life, <clears throat> I don't wish may I suffer the whole day and if possible my whole life. So then I have some, I attach some value to that aspiration. And then why not transporting myself in anyone's mind and think like me, they might be confused, deluded, they might go just at the opposite of what will bring them relief from suffering. There's a Tibetan saying, you know, if you keep your hand in the fire, don't hope not to be burned. Yeah. But that happens. So even then, nobody wants to suffer. So why should I not that value that? So valuing others is at the heart of altruism and its intention. But why there was a need? Because sometimes, you know, we have an expression in French, I don't know if you have it in English, which is to break through open doors. You know, mm -hmm. Like, you know, the firemen, when there's a, a closed door, they come and they boom. But if the door is open, you don't need to do that. <laughs> so I think I felt I had to do that scientifically. Mm -hmm. Because otherwise, people will say, you know, this nice monk coming from the Himalayas is talking the, all this nonsense. So unless there was 1,600 yeah. scientific reference. Yeah. But so why? It was still a need. Yeah. Because my... Uh, my ambition was quite modest, was mostly to study, the, uh, to show that along selfishness, that seems nobody's doubting the existence of, there is genuine altruism in our life, and to show not by appealing to your own experience only, because always people will not be convinced, but that's showing the good science about that. Because the interesting thing about the so-called, they call it psychological selfishness, but it really means Universal selfishness. There's nothing but selfishness if you dig. You know, there's a sentence that says, scratch at the surface of an altruist and the selfish will bleed. I mean, if you go deep enough, you will find that really nasty selfish motivation. So to dispel that, I thought to show the evidence through you know, psychology, evolution, animals, childhood. And then, since that's not enough, because we say, oh, okay, it exists, but so what? Look at the world. To show that the world is not that bad as it seems, that violence, as Steven Pinker has shown, has been steadily declining, no matter what we might say or, or imagine. And then also that there is a, a possibility to change as individuals. C contemplative science, of course, 2,500 years of meditative tradition is all about that, becoming a better human being to better serve others. That's what, you know, the hermitage, 
Well, some people think, oh, it's a bit selfish, you know, you just sit quietly in the Himalayas, we are here paying taxes and all that stuff. <laughs> but you know, if your goal is to eradicate selfishness, you know, how could that be selfish? Because when you come out of it, <laughs> then somehow you are better equipped to serve others. Yeah. And then, but the main question was how you can go from that to societal change. So that was my purpose. Mm -hmm. But then I found that there, not everyone shared those same ideas. You got people like Hobbes yeah. saying, no, yeah. basically humanity is every man in, at war against every man. You got Freud that says, well, I don't know much about human nature, but for me, almost they are all but rascals. <laughs> Good start. Or plot, man is a wolf for man, even though wolves are pretty nice ani social animals, by the way. Uh, but all this idea, and, and economists like Francis Edgeworth saying there's no place for altruism in the economic system, then what? The whole world should run without altruism? Mm. So all that made me realize that there was a strong uh, sort of ideology, actually, about universal selfishness. And this needed to be dispelled and show how you could move from individual change to societal change, and then go to you know, solve, thinking about yeah. what's about the future generation and so forth. So it's, I felt a little bit, uh, you know, I never doubted about the purpose of writing the book, but at some point it was kind of the exhaustion of a peasant <laughs> who's plowing the field, and then he do, how do you call that, those, uh, those lines? Laying, the, yeah. Laying, lines, yes, and I do 10 lines, and I look at the field has got twice as big. <laughs> so, so I thought, never see the end of it. But finally, <laughs> sort of managed after five years. And I didn't mean to make it so big, but I think the subject is so rich and wonderful. Yeah. Because in the end, so many things come back to that question of altruism versus selfishness. Mm. So that's... Yeah, um, and I, I was thinking as I read the book that uh, a lot of traditions have this notion of original sin. And of course, Freud almost suggests we're original neurosis, or original trauma. And you're speaking about original goodness. And one of the things that also came out in the pages is that when the electricity goes out across New York City and people start rioting, media people like myself say, oh, well, that's human nature coming out. On the other hand, we have an impulse that suggests that we are, we are better than our worst moments. And in fact, if you and I were to get drunk tonight and start insulting other people, the next day we'd say, I wasn't myself. In other words, my true self is much better yes. than my bad behavior. So even as the philosophers are telling us that the nature of human, the essence of human nature is savagery, we sense that the essence of human nature is something actually much kinder. Is that your sense? Or? When, when you say going out of yourself, this is something we say often. Yeah. You know, when we really blow the fuse and say yeah. something that we really regret that has harmed someone, you say, you know, I was out of myself, I yes, wasn't yes. myself. I was so myself. those are sort of revealing yeah. words. Yes. And then when you uh, do some act of love, of tenderness, of generosity, how much more? Yeah. Why do you feel sort of good about it? No, it's not yeah. selfish to feel the warm yeah. glow, it's just that maybe you feel the warm glow not as a sort of self-interested way of you know, using altruism to feel a warm glow, which would be selfish, mm. but it will not work, by the way, if your primary goal was to feel the warm glow. You know, I'm going to help this guy. I don't care a damn, but I was told that if I do that, I'll feel the warm glow. <laughs> <laughs> Where is the warm glow? You know? yeah. But I think this is like you know, a flame, like fire. You cannot dissociate burning from heat. Mm. So if, if, you have to, if you express and you let that goodness come at the surface, then the sort of mm. feeling of... Uh, you know, it comes out. And what I think is interesting, if you now want to move to science, you know, there's been all these ideas about kids being you know, irremediably selfish, you have to teach them to be a little bit nicer than these little brutes. You know, the idea that, again, further about the children. It's true, I mean, you can have, have to read it. It's quite amazing what he taught about children. So, but all the studies now show that because we maybe we are social animals, and that's how it's the best way to to function is that the kids from two to four years old, five years old, they are unconditional cooperators. In the lab, that's what really turns mm -hmm. out. If an experimenter lets something fall down, even they are playing somewhere in the room, they all run to help. And they know because if you just throw it, they won't come. And they will overcome obstacles, all kinds of things like that. And there was even a wonderful study with a two years old who 
you make them see some puppets or some little ball with big eyes that go up a ramp, and then there's a bad ball, or green ball that push them down, another the nice yellow ball that push them up, and then you give them those balls. 98% choose the nice one <laughs> they prefer. And with eight months old baby, you can do that. They don't run to the, of course, they can't move much, but you can follow their gaze. And, and when you show the two balls, Again, 95% of eight months old look at the nice one. So this is more uh, going to the idea that, of course, we can deviate in t terrible, horrific cruelty. But somehow, we are a little bit more wired to this original goodness. And of course, in Buddhism, that clearly fits with this notion, because we speak of every sentient being having the Buddha nature. I remember once in France, I was asked to come to a high security prison, and uh, people were there for a very, very long time. And I spoke with them for you know whole afternoon. In fact, it was almost surreal because it was having tea with a group of people. You know, I'm sure they did something terribly wrong to be that long for 20 years or so. But it seems that <laughs> they were pretty old. old. I mean, one or two was looking a bit strange, but most of them say, "What are they doing here, basically?" Of course, they might have changed for 20 years, but one, one of them told, them at the, told me at the end, you know, usually some people come and they say, you know, you are born as terrible people, like original sins or something. On top of that, you have done extremely terrible things, so you are a double sort of sinner, and then we are, we are stuck in this place, so it's not a very, you know, encouraging thing to do to, to, to find some good taste in your life. They say, at least you tell us that there is this potential for goodness that is a piece of gold. I might have thrown that gold in mud or in even more disgusting places, but I can still pick it up, polish it, make it shine. And they sort of say, well, at least that's some kind of encouragement. He's a natural Buddhist, I think. <laughs> well, somehow. Uh, it's interesting, though, how altruism is different from empathy. And sometimes they can be in collision. I just read about how if you show a photograph of one child in suffering and say, please give $10,000 to this child, a lot of people will contribute. If you show five children in suffering and say, please give us $10,000, far fewer will. In other words, the empathic impulse makes us reach out to one fellow human in a way that we don't to masses. Yes. And their empathy actually is preventing us from helping more people. Is so this is a, one of the most interesting uh, questions that... Uh, to you know, meeting extraordinary psychologists like Paul Ekman here in San Francisco and Tanya Singer, who is one of the world's specialists on empathy, over the years, to sort of unpack those notions. Mm -hmm. yeah. I don't know here, but in, in Europe now, empathy is very much uh, in the media. It's almost like if it was uh, altruism was empathy, it was yeah. really the same yeah. thing. And you get books like The Empathic Civilization, and, uh, which is a great book, but you know, this emphasis on empathy. But in fact, what we found in the research, and also I was puzzled myself because the word doesn't exist in Tibetan, and I've, I've not taught much about what it means before until I work with scientists. So it, it seems that it's quite different. You know, altruism basically is at some point, you're not altruistic all the time in every circumstances, but at some point you have a thought, an intention to benefit someone. That's it, you know, that's your ultimate goal. And then you might have other thoughts at other times, but at that moment, I want to benefit that person. That's altruism, okay. Now, what is empathy? Empathy is much more sort of specific and narrow, I would say, and it's very useful, of course. Mm. But the, its point of empathy is to, to become aware, it's a tool to become aware of the situation of the other, other person. And it, it works in different ways. You know, if someone comes with a big smile, I know that he's sort of, uh, you know, in a jolly mood or something because it elicits the same feeling in my mind. And you can see that it also does in your brain. If I see someone, as you said, in deep suffering, the suffering that I feel because of the suffering is totally real. I mean, mm -hmm. if you look at the brain, it's the same areas mm -hmm. that the suffering person activated. So it's not this mirror neurons, which is interesting, but it's very, very more elementary and specific. It's, it's very complex, many areas of the brain, but it's an emotional resonance. Another aspect is the cognitive reason, I mean, 
knowledge to either what is that person feeling, even you don't feel it, or what would I feel in the place of that person, which is not the same. To give you an idea, if I sit next to someone who is terrified in aeroplanes, you know, I'm not, I love flying, or fortunately, because I fly a lot. <laughs> you always on planes. But you know, I don't feel panic, but I can see, I can empathize. Mm. Therefore, okay, now, but if you're stuck in that, what we call stand-alone empathy, and suppose you are a caregiver, a social worker, a nurse, a doctor, I mean, patients, hopefully they cure, or sometimes they die, but it is very rare that they have acute suffering for 20 years nonstop. But if you day after day after day after day suffer because of their suffering and you have no other inner resources to deal with that, it's much too much asking. Mm -hmm. And if you are left with only that, not only five photos, but day after day, of course this will be the burnout. It's called empathic distress, emotional exhaustion. And so this is a huge problem because 60% of all medical personnel in the United States has, are, or will suffer of burnout. So what is the relation to... So empathy should be only a signal. This person is okay, this person is suffering. Then altruism kicks out, kicks in, sorry. Saying, oh, if that person suffers, and my intention is to benefit others, therefore, what should I do? Okay, and then it becomes compassion if the person is suffering, which is the, the ref it is, you know, compassion is uh, basically what altruism becomes when it meets suffering. Mm. Instead of wishing simply everyone, everyone be happy and find a cause of happiness, mm. if it, that person happens to suffer, mm. you know, it's the other face of the coin, mm. may the person cease to suffer and the cause of suffering. But what we found, and which is the most fascinating piece of research with Tanya Singer, is if people, Easily, and I did that in the fMRI machine for one hour. Mm. You know, I, she asked me to meditate only on empathy. She says, leave out your compassion. You know? mm. <laughs> and suffering, suffering, suffering. One hour, I was totally in a state of empathic distress and burnout. And then when I could move finally <laughs> to compassion, got the permission, <laughs> then it was completely different. It's like, a, I feel like a dam of you know, this kind of embracing feeling, of love for the person who was suffering, and it completely changed my, mm. the way I was relate to this in my mind to this person who suffers. Mm. And then we see, you know, very warm-hearted doctors mm. or nurses mm. who don't have so much problem with the burnout. Mm. So now she has been a, she's doing a program of one year at the Max Planck Institute in Leipzig with 350 volunteers to tease out all those elements, and it appears it's very clearly that cultivating altruistic love is a wonderful antidote, mm. like a balm mm. to empathic distress. Mm. How do we decide, though, what is the kind thing to do? Let's say you and I are walking down the street in Nepal, and a little girl comes up with her hand extended. Giving her food or giving her money may, in fact, be the worst possible thing you could do. How do we have the discernment to know what is the right response to that situation? So, yes, you spoke about discernment. So, yes. in a way, compassion should be guided by wisdom, mm. by discernment, by mm. seeing. And I remember very well that it's on the Dalai Lama think, saying about how we check our motivation. Mm. He said, you have to say, is it primarily for me? Which some, of course, there's nothing wrong with wishing to mm. be happy. And, mm. Mm. <laughs> you know, the mistake about those who prone universal selfishness, he says, well, our goal is to survive and be happy. Fine. Right? Who, who will be against that? Mm. There's nothing wrong with wishing yourself good. Therefore, I should be selfish. Now, that's the, where the big mistake happened. Anyway, so the fact that when you are confronted with that, you know, discernment means, so at the dilemma I was saying, is it primarily for me or for the others? Mm -hmm. Is it for a small number or for the larger number? Is it for the short term or the long term? Mm -hmm. Of course, it's quite nice to you know, just do something. And by the way, you know, even in Paris, when now there's, it's quite lot of, much more than before, some people asking, if you give one euro to each one, maximum you will see 10 in the day, no, no big deal. Mm. So you can still do that. Mm. But better than that is to think what is, why is that mm. issue is there? Mm. You know, can we build some schools? Mm. Can we give education to those girls? Yeah. And then think the bigger uh, issue. Mm. Of course in cities, now if you do that in the countryside and you see one person in difficulty or 
then, of course, everyone, most people will come to the help. If you see so many in the daytime, you say, okay, either I do that, mm -hmm. and that's my full-time job, or somebody else should do it. Mm -hmm. So you can always do your drop in the ocean, but the number is kind of overwhelming, and therefore that's why there should be precisely a societal movement of solidarity. Mm -hmm. And one of the issues which I raise in the book is that we need to have a caring economics mm -hmm. because the maximization of personal interest, which is supposed to guide the classical economics, will never address the question of poverty in the midst of plenty. Mm -hmm. Will never address the question of the common goods, the quality of the air, of, mm -hmm. the, of the environment, of even social justice, the fight for freedom, and so forth. Mm -hmm. Because that as that you step out mm -hmm. of this, you know, me, 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 and mm -hmm. only thinking of the world as instrument mm -hmm. to your interest or as threat to yeah. those interests. Yeah. And one of the really inspiring ideas that comes out of your book on happiness is that we change the world in the way you were just describing by changing the way we look at the world. And so would you say that if all of us in this room probably want to be more altruistic, would you say that the first step to take is to train the mind? which is probably to meditate or to... I think you have this beautiful phrase in the new book about having an intelligent dialogue with your emotions. Yeah? Well, yes, because you see, again, uh, you have to see a little bit the long term. Mm. So now if people say, well, you know, what, what can your meditation do about ISIS or Sudan or something? Mm. Well, this is, this is not the right question. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, when the forest is in fire, no, you don't dwell anymore about the spark, but there was a spark, yeah. and that spark is yeah. precisely lack of compassion, yeah. devaluing yeah. others, yeah. demonizing yeah. others, yeah. or seeing them as the enemy, or what, because they belong yes. to a different religion, yeah. or whatever yeah. The, yeah. is the issue, and this kind of set mindset starts in few people and sort of spread. Yeah. Yes. So it began with that. Yeah. When the forest is in fire, it's too late. So to address that, you have to, yeah. it's something to go much more in depth. But in the, in the end, it always begins in someone's mind. Yeah. We are not robots. Yeah. So societal change has to begin with a certain number of individuals that sort of have a different perception of, yeah. of others, and that value others, that are concerned by others. And then when these, uh, there's a critical mass within a group, within a society, there could be tipping points in the culture. Mm. So, but unless individual starts, mm. not going to work. Yeah. No, the idea that a, a, a government or a system should tell you, okay, we know how to make you happy, we know how to make you altruistic, but this, how can it work? Mm. Because it's in your heart. Mm. So, Totalitarian system have been trying to do that, and my late father, Jean-François Revel, he said, they tell you, we know how to make you happy, just have to follow what, you, your, what we tell you, but only thing, if you don't agree, we uh, regretfully have to eliminate you. <laughs> <laughs> or I heard a Colombian general, which I quote in the happiness book, saying, I love peace, therefore I must eliminate all those who don't love peace. <laughs> what to do? Yeah. You have that wonderful sentence in the book about how it's much, much easier um, than in eliminating all your enemies. It's just eliminating all your bad thoughts towards them. Well, this is based on, the, on a beautiful uh, verse in the, in the traditional Buddhist teachings about the world being filled, uh, covered with uh, thorns. Mm. And you might say, I need to cover the whole world with leather so that I can work in peace. Mm. But then someone say, well, if you cover the sole of your feet, or the world, the world, yeah. wherever yeah. you walk, yeah. you will not yeah. be bothered by the thorns. Yeah. So in a way, if you remove hatred yeah. from your heart, yeah. Yeah. and then the notion of an enemy that needs to be destroyed, yeah. that needs to be you know, <laughs> annihilated, yes. uh, changed, and even you face with the bloody dictators, your goal will not be to squash them into a mass of uh, bleeding flesh, but to hope that yeah. somehow to some di direct or indirect means, in the short or the long term, what made them to be what they are, that is hatred, cruelty, indifference, greed, whatever, mm -hmm. that those things 
somehow, some way, through education, to whatever, yeah. at least yeah. in, the, in the culture from which they, they came about, could be eradicated. Mm -hmm. So it's not that you will be tolerant, you would let them perpetuate their terrible action. Those have to be neutralized in the best possible way, but without hatred. Thinking how, like the, the, how a physician will look at a terribly mad and dangerous person. Mm -hmm. So control the person and then see, can I cure that person? If not, then keep it in a place where the person can harm. Mm -hmm. If yes, start the treatment. But even the, the patient start kicking the doctor, yeah. he's not going to have a big stick and beat, <laughs> beat the guy down. So, yeah. so yeah. that attitude yeah. is not like, a, how do you say, a kind of permissive attitude. You don't excuse, you don't mm. sort of mm. diminish the gravity of their mm. actions, but you take a different outlook. Mm. And I think one of the things that I enjoyed about the book is it's very pragmatic, as with uh, His Holiness the Dalai Lama. You're offering very specific things we can do and specific examples of people who economically, politically, and otherwise have actually taken the altruistic course. Well, but you know, for that, I think you first have to establish that altruism is a pragmatic answer. Yeah, yeah. And I, as I was mentioning mm -hmm. when we were discussing, because you see, altruism can easily be seen as something quite naive. You may say, well, you know, this is a nice idea, but you know, the world is not ruled by nice ideas and sort of sweet, nice people who love peace and so forth. So, and it's, you know, how can you put that in action? But in fact, if you think of the challenges of our times, you know, one of the main ones which really struck me over those many years of uh, research and meeting wonderful people in all walks of life, I must say, I was so fortunate from the Dalai Lama or Desmond Tutu to economists to scientists to whatever, so social workers, you know, is that there's big disconnect between the short term, the mid term, and the long term. You know, economy mm -hmm. speaks, of course, of what's going to happen t tomorrow when they open the, you know, the stock market open in New York or somewhere, end of the year, but not 50 years. You know, it's not their job. It's, you can blame that. It's not their job. And then you would think of uh, the quality of life th throughout a generation, your life, that's of your dear ones, that's of society, how we fare about in life, what kind of fulfillment we derive from life. And then there is the, for the first time in our history, we are the major actor, we are really determining the fate of future generation. That took us by surprise. Because 10,000 years ago, there was 5 million people on Earth. What would they do? They could not m have a much impact. So nobody feels individually responsible because nobody decided I'm going to ransack the planet. But the conjunction of the increase of population, the multiplication, thousandfold of our power to act and to extract resources, etc., etc., makes us the major actor. We enter the Anthropocene. So now I know, you know this is common among environmentalist scientists that there's a lot of depression in, among them because they know what could still be done, but they are perceived as troublemakers. It's like if a doctor was perceived as a troublemaker because he said, you know, you have to follow a treatment. It's not fun, but that's save your life. Or just leave me alone, you know, I don't feel well. And on top of that, you come with all these things that you have just... <laughs> I will come to see you when I have time and I will feel very good. <laughs> or if you tell me that I will be killed by this thing in 10 years, I'll come to see you in nine, mo in nine years and nine months. <laughs> so what does that say? make sense? So then you need a concept to have all these people who have this potential for goodness, I'm sure, some, something somewhere, <laughs> to work together for a better world. What even at the World Economic Forum, the motto for many years is, for a, what you say is working for a better world. And even there, you know, the, the founder of the Economic Forum this year opened his first speech, so I said, let's put this week under the auspices of caring and compassion. Okay, that's maybe just word, but at least it's a good word. So why that concept can be the pragmatic answer? Because if you have more consideration for others, then everything falls into place. You, know, you will work for a caring economics that remedies to inequality, take care of the environment. You will work to more social justice and m making sure that everyone has the possibility to express the potential they have within themselves and flourish in life. Otherwise, where's the point? Mm -hmm. 
And then, if you are more consideration for others, you are not going to jeopardize the fate of future generations. They will say, you knew and you did nothing. It's like if you, before dying, you burn all your possessions, all your cars, and you say your kids, you know, okay, good luck. Yeah. <laughs> well, the empathic and the selfish thing for me would be now to bombard you with 600 more questions that I have. But I think the altruistic one would be to open it up to all of you. Uh, we have 10 more minutes, and we'd love to hear your questions. I'm not sure if we have mics, so maybe you could broadcast them as loudly as your voice will allow. Um, yes, done. Oh, okay. I think this gentleman will be able to project his voice. How are we supposed to think about ISIS? How are we supposed to think about ISIS? Yes, sure. Well, you know, it's a bit uh, sort of, uh, I was addressing that indirectly, saying that it is not playing the sort of, how uh, do you say, passive um, sort of, oh, those guys are not so bad after all. The actions have to be counteracted with any possible means. That's no question, because Altruism asks for, and compassion specifically, asks for goal to really diminish suffering wherever suffering is, whatever kind of suffering they could be. That's a very sort of pragmatic utilitarian goal. So now, how to achieve that? Of course, that's the, always the big question. You know, besides ISIS, most of those ideas of uh, what they call, I don't know if it's, the, what you say in English, punctual violence, you no know, Kosovo, and you know, they will go for eight days and everything will be fine. It was the same in Iraq. And, and usually the escalating and uh, you know, the chain reaction often seems that instead of eight days, you are there for eight years or something. So it is always that this, you want to alleviate suffering. You want by all means to prevent people to inflict unspeakable you know, suffering on others. So to be in a weak sort of reaction is no good. But then the, when, when I say that the eye of the doctor is the doctor with a very drastic treatment, but not with hatred. So how to do in the moment and in the long term? So the long term, of course, comes from all kinds of factors which we know promote violence, which is isolation, lack of education, low status for women, all kinds of things which are, seems to be what breeds sort of violence and inequalities, all kinds of things. But in the moment, of course, when you, again, it's when you face the forest fire and you say, you know, how altruism could work, how meditation could work. So at that moment, you have to see what are the best way to minimize suffering or to prevent immense suffering. So in that case, if that's the only way you could conceive of, uh, of you know, using, of course, we have to probably using drastic means. There's a story you know, in, the, in the sutras that there was, a, you know, of course, it's a, it's a symbolic story uh, that a merchant who was on the ship with 500 merchants and he heard that one of them was going to sink the ship to get all the wealth. And he decided that even in Buddhism, taking the life of someone was the, this the most terrible thing you could do that would plunge you <laughs> in the depth of hell. He would do it out of compassion because to save lives. So he would kill to save lives. And he said it he actually accrued a lot of virtue. So that's just a parabola, but to say that if that's the best mean, and someone was asked, uh, uh, Dalai Lama, who is one of your close friends, uh, saying, what do you do if someone comes with a gun and wants to shoot everybody? He said, well, I will start shooting in the feet, in the legs. And if that's enough and the guy falls down, I'll come and pet his head. And, but, but if it's, that's not sufficient, anything that allows to minimize suffering, but has to do with, with, with discernment and with, without hate. So, but, but that doesn't mean that if you don't have hate, you cannot use the most energy mix to achieve that goal. But still, the ultimate wish to benefit others in the long term, of course, the victims and not allow them to perpetuate that immense suffering should be your main motivation. And that is, that's what the main motivation of most people who would intervene. Not revenge, not hatred, but 
preventing suffering by all means that are necessary. I don't know if that makes sense. Easier said than done. <laughs> I think there is a microphone. Uh, yes, and we have time maybe just for one more question. So um, the microphone's on its way to you, I think. Dalai Lama uh, has gone through such horrendous problems. What is his secret to still smile? Well, what to say? You know, when the terrible things happened in 2009, hundreds of people were killed, thousands were you know, disappeared, were put in jail in, in Tibet before the Olympics. You know, he felt quite powerless. But he said still, when he looked deep, deep, deep within, he still has this sense of uh, some place of peace, not that he don't care about Tibetan people, that you can imagine, and all those terrible things, but because you know, the notion of what deep well-being is not a question of not being sad. He was immensely sad. We have seen the Dalai Lama so many times shedding tears. And he said once recently, he confided this to a group of friends, that last 30 years, every single morning at some point during these four hours of meditation, he shed tears at some moment thinking of the suffering of the beings. But the sadness comes together with the immense courage of compassion because that suffering doesn't sort of pile up upon him in a sort of empathic distress, which is reacting to the suffering of the world by the impact it has on you, and that's all. He reacts to the suffering of the world in an others-oriented way. So the more suffering, the more courage the more determination, the more sort of fortitude. Anything that can be done should be done. And so that's something that is not undermining your sense of purpose, of meaning, of direction, of compassion, of wisdom. It's actually going that way. It's only if you fall in despair that then you lost that. And I've often heard him speak about wider perspective. And he says that for all of us, if we're just concentrated on our problems, they seem insuperable. It's us against seven billion people, massive boulders falling down on us. But as long as we can make our perspective wider and wider in time and space, there are so many sources of strength and so many sources of optimism that, in fact, suddenly the dis despair dissipates and we realize we have more strength than we think. Isn't that right? Yes, of course. Yes, yes. But um, just to, I mean, I'm still, uh, you know, not unsatisfied with the reference <laughs> I give you, Dick. I think that, you know, we should never uh, so hesitate for any reason to find the right means to minimize suffering globally. So that is really a compassionate courage. So it's not about being weak. Nonviolence is, or choosing mm -hmm. a nonviolent option or a violent one when it's necessary proceeds naturally from compassion when it's the need. Like a mother, you know, imagine a mother that sees a child about to be run over by a car. You know, she said, my sweet little boy, would you mind coming that way? You know, Too late. He has to push the boy and then save the life. But if you look at the action, it looks violent. But the motivation was to break out through the cycle of hate and suffering. Perfect note on which to end. Thank you, Mathieu. And there's a book signing in the lobby. Thank you very much.